uh, I'd like to thank the Commonwealth of Learning for their help in making these videos and making them available. Uh, my f the first one is going to be on developing quality blended, uh, blended learning courses. Um, after COVID-19, uh, blended learning will be the big challenge for most uh, post-secondary institutions. Uh, I think all courses in the future will be a mix, some mix of face-to-face -face and online learning, except for courses that are fully online. But while we know a lot about uh, how to do design fully online courses, we're not so uh, familiar with blended learning courses, which are quite new, and I want to provide some guidelines on these in this keynote. So in the overview, I'll give some definitions. I'll talk about the impact of COVID-19 um, and how that's going to affect uh, what's going to happen afterwards. And then I want to address the issue of what makes the campus special. Uh, why should students come on campus when they can do a lot of their learning online? Then I'm going to talk about the difference between synchronous and asynchronous uh, learning, uh, because that's a really important aspect of blended learning. I'm going to talk about the need for redesigning courses to get the best out of both online and face-to-face, -face. and then uh, a short section on quality and assessment of blended learning, and then some discussion of the policy implications of moving to blended. There are many forms of blended learning. Uh, the most simplest is a face-to-face -face lecture, uh, or a series of lectures, but the students have some reading materials or the PowerPoint slides are put up on a learning management system or a virtual learning environment for supporting the face-to-face -face teaching. Then there's the flipped classroom where uh, the video is recorded and students stream the video and watch it at their convenience, but then they come into a class for discussion or for activities based around the video. And then there's mainly online, with, but with face-to-face -face tutorials. So students will study primarily online, but they will come in maybe once a week maybe not even on a regular basis, but on an as-needs basis to talk to the instructor. Then there's what I call hybrid learning, which is a reduced face-to-face -face learning, um, but with the face-to-face -face deliberately designed to take advantage of the advantages of face-to-face -face teaching, but mo most of the course is done online. And then there's HyFlex, and I'll talk a little bit more about HyFlex, and there are probably others. This is a fast evolving area, and it's very hard to provide good definitions because people are still inventing different ways of doing it. So what are the implications of COVID-19? Well, in 2020, we, there was a rapid pivot to emergency remote learning. Certainly in my country, in Canada, uh, all instructors and students pivoted to online learning in a two-week period. That was 100,000 instructors move their courses online in two weeks. Amazing feat. And of course, it wasn't pretty always, but it was an amazing uh, achievement. So many instructors have now been exposed to the online possibilities. Um, now, particularly on the online lectures streamed via Zoom and so on, but also other aspects of online learning. But of course, there are many poor quality online courses. Uh, there was 30 years of experience of designing online courses before COVID-19, but most instructors didn't have the time to find out about those, and the easiest thing to do was to put uh, their, their, their lectures uh, on, on Zoom and do it. So they didn't change their teaching methods to take account of the fact that students were studying in isolation on their own. So there's been a big learning curve um, for many instructors and instructors are beginning to understand a little better now the, re the strengths and weaknesses of online learning. So what's the impact going to be? Well, in, in Canada, uh, the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association had been surveying the extent of online learning in Canadian universities and colleges up, uh, up to 2019. And you can see from that graph that um, about 10% of all uh, credit courses were fully online in Canadian universities and colleges. Um, 
blended learning, we didn't have such a good uh, way of tracking those. Uh, that's more than the number of institutions that were offering at least some blended learning was about 25%. About a quarter of them were offering some kind of blended learning before COVID-19. Now, what happens after 2020 is my prediction, and uh, it's always dangerous making predictions because they never turn out the way you think. But my guess is that fully online will get a little boost as a result that particularly perhaps in courses like professional master's programs, faculty and, and students will want them fully online now. Um, but I don't see it going up much above 25% because there's a, a, a limit to the market for fully online courses. They appeal mainly to lifelong learners, people or, or students trying to complete their last courses at university, but there's a limit to the number of students who will take courses fully online. Whereas I see that most instructors after 2020 will incorporate at least some form of online learning in their classroom teaching and their in-person teaching. So I would see something like by in, in maybe 10 years time, nearly all teaching being either blended or hybrid or fully online with very little just straight face-to-face -face teaching with no online components. But are we ready for that? Um, again, the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association survey into institutions reported that there was inadequate training for faculty in teaching online or blended. The faculty felt that online or hybrid learning was more work. Um, and in particular, there was no redesign in blended learning. It was just being added on, uh, the online component, on top of the face-to-face -face teaching. Now, that's... that's the, the, the big picture, there were pockets of innovation and some momentum, but it was too slow. Not enough change was happening. Um, and one of the things about fully online learning is that it's normally been a team approach with instructional designers working with faculty. But when everybody's teaching uh, in a blended format, you can't scale up that team approach. It just won't scale up to every, every instructor. So that means instructors have got to learn um, how to do blended learning. It, it, it can't be sort of handed off to uh, a centre for teaching and learning, although they can have a great impact on, on, on how it's done. So basically, uh, I'm arguing that all institutions now need a plan. How are they going to move towards blended learning so that it's a quality uh, offering? It's not just uh, a, a watered down form of face-to-face -face teaching. So what would it be in a plan? Um, well, you need to know what the rationale and goals are for going to a blended learning model. Uh, there is evidence that even blended learning increases access for students who are working, for instance, or are working even part-time. They prefer a blended model where they can adapt to uh, their work schedules. Uh, for skills development, there, we'll see in a moment that uh, the online component can be very useful for helping develop the 21st century soft skills that are now in demand. And also for resilience, if you've got a blended learning course that's working quite well and you have to shut the campus for whatever reason, it's much easier to take the, the remaining components and put them online temporarily until you can get back to a normal, normal action. So you would need actions to support change and responsibilities for those actions within the organisation. And I suggest particularly that this is done at a departmental or even a program level rather than just at an institutional level. You need targets and timelines for how, when you're going to move to blended learning and what the mix is likely to be. You need a financial strategy and uh, you need to uh, plan, uh, work out how you need to evaluate the plan to see how well it's working. Now, at the moment, about two-thirds of institutions in Canada uh, do either have a plan or are implementing one. And you'll see the, in, the, in the graphic there, uh, University of Ottawa developed a plan several years ago. It's implemented its plan now, and it's working very well. And not surprisingly, they were very well placed when COVID-19 struck. So 
Um, you do need a plan, and I think it's really important to see blended learning as a key strategy, teaching strategy for the future. So that raises the question then of what makes the campus special? Well, the default per position is that in-person in teaching is inherently superior to online learning. Unfortunately, the research says that isn't so. There's enough research to show that online learning in many cases is just as good, if, as, if not better, than face-to-face -face teaching when you look at the student outcomes. What the research shows, it's not so much the mode of delivery that matters, it's how well you do each, it's the conditions that matter. You can do face-to-face -face teaching well or badly, and you can do online learning well or badly. So what we need to look at are what are the conditions for successful blended learning. So it, I have what I call the law of equal substitution. Everything can be taught as well online as in person, except, and it's the exceptions we need to look at now. So what are the exceptions? Why should students get on the bus to come to campus? Well, I think there are three factors that influence this. Individual student needs, the requirements of different subject areas, and then a whole batch of non-teaching issues that are nevertheless important for sustaining student learning. And of course, what will make a difference is what the instructor is familiar with and comfortable with. So what makes the campus special for students? Well, we know that older, more experienced students with family commitments um, prefer fully online in general. And students with part-time work like blended or hybrid learning. But students coming fresh from school and students without adequate internet access equipment or places to study at home prefer a fully campus, campus experience. But often the class, of course, is a mix. You've got, a, you've got all these students in your class. And that's why the idea of high flex learning, where students can really choose exactly how and when they study. They can do it all online. They can come into campus whenever they feel like it, or they can do it all face to face. But I think there are lots of challenges in doing high flex well. It's a lot of work, extra work for everybody, for faculty particularly. The subject requirements, we know now that most, in most subject areas, the theory, the content, and soft skills are just as well, if not better, taught online. And I'll come to the reasons why these uh, activities are best done online rather than on campus. But there are still a lot of hands-on and practical work that needs to be done on campus. Um, we, I'm thinking here of trades, some uh, science labs and so on, etc. But again, I will be cautious. This will change over time as we get more experienced in uh, online learning in these areas. We, f we are finding that online can reduce the hands-on time through the use of video to, video to demonstrate how things work, for instance, simulations, um, serious games, virtual reality, and virtual labs. And I'll say a little bit more about open education resources later, but these are resources, online resources you can download. And many of these videos and simulations now are available free uh, on the internet. So as we get more and more high quality uh, open education resources uh, in these areas, it will be, enable institutions to reduce time on, uh, with hands-on uh, teaching. And then, as I said, there's a whole range of non-teaching factors. Um, students, uh, particularly younger students, want the social life that they get with being on campus and the cultural activities that go with it. But also there's a lot of support facilities often on campuses, like libraries and study areas. Um, COVID-19 showed us that many students do not have very good conditions at home for studying. They have uh, siblings or parents working from home or their mothers with young children at home. And these students often need uh, somewhere quiet where they can go. And that's what a campus can often provide for them. And informal counseling, the, the off chance of meeting a professor and ch chatting and so on, or meeting other students informally. We found that a lot of informal learning goes on in these social areas. Students may talk about 
uh, uh, sports and so on. Uh, and they may chat up uh, girls or boys, um, but often they often spend time talking about what what they were studying, what they're studying as well. So these social activities on campus are really important. So if we're looking at the affordances of on campus, we also need to look at the affordances of online and particularly the different media that you can use online. Now, what do I mean by affordances? I, it, it's what the medium does best in a particular educational context. I'll give you some examples, for instance. Uh, uh, text, we know, is quite good for evidence-based ar arguments and analysis. Video is very good for demonstrating processes. And we need to look at the affordances of synchronous versus asynchronous medium. And I, I like to talk about media rather than technology or tools because media is a broader concept. And if we do that, we can think of in-person teaching as just one other medium amongst many in which we can deliver uh, teaching and learning. And media affordances are likely to vary by subject area. What works well in philosophy may not work well uh, in, in science, for instance. And the other thing I have to say about this is there's no real research on this. It's a slippery concept, the affordances of media. Uh, it depends a lot on, on the imagination of the instructor, the imagination of the video producers, and so on. So most of what we know about affordances is from personal experience. And we know that can be dangerous, but it's all we have to go on at the moment. I need to say something here about synchronous or asynchronous media. Synchronous media are things like classroom teaching, where everybody has to be together at the same time and same place. And web conferencing is not the same time and same place, but it's synchronous because it's at the same time. Asynchronous means that you can uh, actually access the learning whenever the learner feels like doing it. So um, that can be text, and a learning management system is primarily text-based. Uh, recorded video, because um, students can download that and play it whenever they want to. Recorded po podcasts, for instance, for audio. Uh, or, or simulations when, uh, when recorded. So um, what COVID-19 brought out very clearly was the difference between synchronous and asynchronous learning. And most classroom because most classroom teaching is synchronous, when many faculty moved to online learning, they just carried over their synchronous teaching uh, by using Zoom Live. Whereas in fact, they, they could just as well have recorded the program and allowed students to stream it whenever they wanted. So with synchronous technology, which is the same time, the same place, you can have an immediate response. Uh, from students. You can have uh, a, 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 a real-time discussion. So if you think that for students uh, thinking on their feet and being able to communicate in a live situation is important, then that's an obvious use of synchronous learning. But asynchronous has actually many more affordances than synchronous, mainly because the student has much more control over the learning situation. They can access it any time and any place, so it's convenient. But more importantly, they can stop materials, they can restart, and they can review content. Now, I have an interesting experience. I was working in the British Open University, um, and the BBC did uh, radio programs to go with the uh, printed materials that the students were using at the Open University. And when audio cassettes came in in the 1970s, um, they moved the radio programs, uh, made them available on audio cassettes. And we found that students who listened only to the audio cassettes did better uh, in their learning than the students who only listened to the broadcasts. And we, w when we further explored that, we found that students were spending more time because they could stop the recording, go back and listen to it again, and so on. Um, and also, students can do a lot of uh, research or project work or online collaboration asynchronously. So, for instance, in an online discussion forum, 
it's asynchronous, so a student can, can actually go off and do a little bit of research before responding to uh, a, a, an instructor or another student's comments. So they can give a considered response as distinct from an immediate response. So again, it's looking at the sensitivity of these different ways of teaching and thinking of how you can exploit their affordances best. So one strategy I suggest in my book, which I'll refer to later, is for choosing between in-person or online and a blended model. First of all, identify your overall teaching approach and what's, how you're going to teach a particular topic. And in particular, the necessary learner activities. What do the students need to do in order to learn whatever this topic is? What resources do you have available, both online and face-to-face? -face? And then analyze the most appropriate mode for each learner activity. And the example I give here is from uh, a, a chemistry, uh, a, a health course, where uh, you're looking at the constitution of blood and the impact of glucose on the blood. Um, now here I've, on the left hand side I've written down the activities that students have to do. They have to learn the theory and the terminology. That can be done better probably online than in face to face. They however need to observe the blood analytes under a microscope. And to actually operate the microscope and see the blood analytes, they probably have to come in to a lab to do that. Uh, if you wanted them, though, to set up an experiment or uh, show how an experiment could be done in this area, you could actually use virtual equipment uh, and students could choose the pieces of equipment that were most appropriate and how they should be put together. And they could do that online, actually. Um, and also video of interactions under the microscope. That's probably best done online if you have good video of that. Um, but inserting the glucose would have to be done face to face. So if you can break it down by the activities that students have, you might be able to come together with what kind of things will be done online and what will be done face to face. What are the standards for blended learning? Now, over 30 years of fully online learning, we know what works online and what doesn't. There are a lot of quality standards for fully online learning. Um, and these have been identified through research and experience. For example, one of the things we've learned um, is just moving lecture content online leads to poor results. It's to do with cognitive load. Students can only focus for about 15, 20 minutes. So merely recording your online lecture and making it available would make a big improvement than doing it live, for instance. But that's just a minor change. Really, we need to redesign for online learners. And when we do good online courses, it normally often takes two to three months to break down all the student activities, work out what, how to do them online and so on, and restructure the whole course so it's not just lecture-based. So we've got lots of quality standards, more than 20 um, for online learning for different sectors, for uh, universities, for schools, different countries have their own uh, quality standards for online learning. The one on the right, Quality Matters, is the most common one used in North America, um, in the US and Canada. Um, they're based on experience and research. They're all quite similar. They're mainly process focused. Have you done this? Have you got clear objectives? Um, how often do you interact? Do, do you have interaction with students built in? And it, it's often a box ticking exercise. You go through and make sure you've done all these activities. And they work pretty well. But they're often unknown or ignored by teachers uh, and, and instructors and administrators. But they are out there if you want to use them. But we don't have quality standards for blended learning. Now, these quality standards are based on uh, past best practices. I took a slightly different approach in my book. Because online learning and blended learning and digital learning is so dynamic, we need something that is not only backwards looking, but also forwards looking as well. So my definition for quality are teaching methods that successfully help learners develop the knowledge and skills they will require in a digital age. So in a, in a sense, there's a kind of criterion or standard to be reached. 
but there might be different routes by which you can reach that standard. And the reason I've done that is there's a conflict between best practices and innovation. If you follow best practices which are um, backwards looking, then it can cramp innovation. It can stop you doing things that are not on the checklist. So I think that we need to be innovative as well as where we can follow best practices. So it's not either or, I think, but we need a more open method of quality standards. So in my book, I've got nine quality standards and I'm not going to go through these now. Um, I'll just go through a couple of them because uh, it'll give you an indication of how they can be applied to blended learning. The first, one of the most important things when you go to a blended learning model is thinking about the core structure um, and particularly the relationship between any synchronous technologies like Zoom and asynchronous technologies like the learning management system. Now the, the benefit of a learning management system is that it provides an organizing structure. And again, people say, well look, we've got a, we, we a credit-based system based on seat time. Three hours uh, a week lectures is a three credit course. And that doesn't work when you start going online or blended. A much more uh, robust way of looking at this is look at the student workload. How many hours a week would you expect the average student to spend on a course? Now, if you take 40 hours a week um, and eight weeks uh, for, and five courses a, a semester, then that would work out at about eight weeks per course. Now, it doesn't matter to me exactly how many hours per week that you come up with because every country has different standards, but you should have uh, a goal in your mind as to what the, you know, the, what the average time should be for a student to spend studying your course per week. And the learning management system allows you to organize that um, around eight hours a week. Now you can have weekly topics or projects that go for longer, um, but that eight hours must cover all student activities, including research, reading, writing, assignments. And you have to then work out where do the in-person sessions fit. For instance, it's not just the one hour that they have in class. You also need to count in their travel time, for instance, to get to campus and back again. And the other thing I would say is that with online learning, it's the students that must do the work. And I'll say a little bit more about student motivation and how to get, engage them uh, later. But you need to get students working online. They must need to know what they have to do each week and that has to be very clear to them. So if we take 40 hours per week study, um, five courses, eight hours per course, all activities in person and online. So if you have four hours class time, that leaves only four hours online for students. If you have one hour class time, they can spend seven hours online uh, in a week. So the question is, what is the best split of time? And who should decide this? Now, again, in universities in Canada, it's the instructor who can decides that, who decides that. But often regulatory authorities require a certain number of hours of seat time, and that doesn't work so well for blended learning. But the main danger is student overload, giving them too much work to do. Because what often happens with blended learning, you, you you keep all the face-to-face -face teaching time, but you add extra work online. How do you keep students engaged in the online component? Well, you have to set clear expectations of what they're to do. There must be something every week for them to do, and they must be not assessed on it necessarily, but they must know that you're watching whether they're doing it or not. But in particular for online students, it's really important to build a sense of community. If they're only coming in a couple of times a week or once a week, they're probably not going to get to know each other as well as if they were coming in uh, on a full-time basis. So get students to post bios. They have to agree to this. You have to get their permission. But they can put their bios up in the learning management system so they can see who the other students are. I like to have an online cafe. That's where students can go on my course to discuss issues that are not course issues. I learned that very quickly. I often found that students were discussing latest sports, sports events or latest uh, online trivia. 
I wanted to get that out of my course, so I gave them an online cafe where they could go and just socialize with each other and talk about anything I wanted. Online discussion forums are very good. Um, this is an online collaborative group, but it could work with the Zoom, with Zoom breakout rooms as well. Um, so you have a teacher monitoring each of the online discussion groups, and the online discussion groups ha have a, a target, have some work to do that the teacher sets, um, and the teacher monitors what they do and gives feedback. Social media with a course hashtag uh, uh, for tw tweets, for instance, that you can send out, but also the students can send. And lay down rules, institutional rules about online behavior and course rules about what you expect them to do in the course. So the students need regular activities and regular feedback to keep them engaged. A critical factor for um, students in the online component of a blended course is support from you as an instructor. Now you don't have to read everything the students post, uh, you don't have to comment on every comment that the students make, but they do need you to be there. There's a lot of research on this. The two most important things for online learning is instructor presence and a sense of community amongst the students. Um, so one of the good things about online, about the learning management system, is that you can track the work of each student. What I often do is, uh, some, some learning management systems already have the tool built in, but if you don't, aren't aware of this tool, so just think of a spreadsheet where uh, you have a list of students down one column, and across the top you have a list of activities that the students have to do each week. And you can go online and see which of those activities the students have done. Now, if you want, you can give a grade to that, but that's hard work. Sometimes just to tick it off and then just have a glance at the end of the week. And if you see student X hasn't done anything, then just send them an email, for instance. So regular communication with the students. You can use social media for a blast, if you like, to all students. But often an individual email will... will be very much appreciated by a student to know that you're paying attention to what that student is doing online. You might want to have a course blog where you put up, a, a, where you do a blog each week and allow students to contribute to that blog. Um, some students uh, at the University of British Columbia have built their own course wikis. Now the difference between a wiki and an online discussion forum is that the online discussion forum is within the learning management system and is protected against anybody else except the ones enrolled in the course. But a wiki is public. And one of the courses they had was on Latin American studies and the students wanted to open up their discussions to anybody, and they were saying, we're not getting any comments from Latin American uh, professors or students on this. So they took a lot of their online discussion forum and put it up in an open wiki, and within two weeks, they were getting cont contributions from professors from Argentina and Colombia and so on, um, often disagreeing with what, were, what, what they were saying, but it opened up their course. So if you can, make time for personal feedback and respond quickly. If somebody, if a student sends you an email, give them some rules. Say, I, I will get back to you within 48 hours, but I'm not over the weekend. I'm off on the weekend and don't expect a response then. But Monday to Friday, I'll try and get to you within 48 hours. So they've got clear expectations. And in particular, manage your workload. And by doing, the best way to do that is to offload a lot of the work to the students, get them to do the, stu do, do the work, and particularly as much collaboration between students so they're giving feedback as well to each other. And lastly, assessment. Now this de will depend on who decides an assessment in your system. Sometimes assessment requirements are set external to the institution and you don't have any say over it. For instance, uh, professional accreditation agencies often re require assessment to be done in a particular way. But the important thing about online learning is that you can have continuous or formative assessment as well as summative assessment. In other words, you can, because you're tracking students as they go, you can assess them as they go as well. 
Um, and that saves, you, you, you spread the, the, uh, the marking load out that way. And particularly if you start getting them working on projects or on group work, that can reduce the amount of work uh, of individually assessing every student. Uh, so you can track their, their, their development over time. And one very useful way of doing this is the use of an e-portfolio, where students um, collect their work together and put it into a document, which they can, they can have two versions of it. They can have their private version, which is just for their own use, or they can have a public version, which they share with you, and which you may actually use for assessment purposes. And in fact, some accreditation agencies now are requiring students to develop an e-portfolio. For instance, teaching practice, sometimes uh, the accreditation agency will now ask the student to record their teaching practice and then reflect on their teaching practice um, and provide that as evidence of um, their, their abilities. It's really important then to decide on assessment at the beginning of the design process and work back from that. If you're going to do e-portfolios or if you're going to have continuous assessment, you really need to build that in from the very beginning rather than wait till the end and worry about how you're going to assess them. And in particular, you're asking students to do activities to keep them engaged online, but make sure those activities really build towards assessment. I don't assess students on discussion forums. I don't give them a grade for that. If they don't participate, I'll chase them up. Well, what I do try to do is to make sure that that discussion is very much related to the assessment they're likely to get at the either during the course or at the end. And I, I actually make that link between the discussion topic and the assessment strategy so that they know why they're in that discussion forum. They're, they're working towards doing a good assessment. One of the big issues that came out over COVID-19 was using uh, proctoral uh, web cameras for students doing paper, doing, doing tests with their computers. You can avoid all the problems with that by having a continuous and formative assessment. Um, and this will, and particularly if you're teaching skills, this is much better way to assess them than the traditional paper and pencil way of, of assessing students. So I come back to quality again. I emphasize the importance of good course design. Um, both online or in-person teaching can be good or bad. Students need a structure. They need to know what the split of their work should be between online and in-person. They need regular activities done on time. There's a role for both synchronous and asynchronous teaching. Um, there's a role for in-person teaching, but it must focus on, or it should focus, on the things that can't be done as well online. And do we need new standards for blended learning? I'm not so sure. We have lots of standards for face-to-face -face teaching, most of which are not really known by many instructors. We have lots of standards for online learning. I don't think we need new standards for blended learning. There's a lot of overlap between the two. There are specific things you need for fully online learning, but there are also probably a few sta extra standards for blended learning. More importantly are the policy implications of moving to blended learning. Blended learning needs teaching environments where knowledge and skills can be demonstrated. If students are doing work online and away from the class, they will need to bring it in and show it. Um, they'll need to share their work digitally as well. So that means having secure systems online. Um, and that's why a learning management system is so useful because it does have high security. Students can work individually or in groups, both face-to-face -face and online. And evidence of digital learning can be stored and securely accessed by both students and teachers. And, on the, and here you see um, one is the architect's plan for a blended learning classroom. And the other is um, a high-tech team-based environment uh, from Queen's University in Ontario. Here you see the, the instructors uh, sitting at a pod like Captain Kirk in Star Trek, students in, uh, with, with study tables around, and each study table has their own screen. 
So the instructor can use all the screens to show something from her desk, or each group can show their own screen and share that with the other students. And there's also individual study carols where a student can go out and do a little bit of work online and come back into the class. So as we move to more blended and hybrid learning, we're going to need different kinds of teaching spaces. The other issue for me, the big one, is how do we scale quality blended learning? How do we move it from a few instructors to everyone? And how do we, so that means preparing and training our instructors so that they're aware of the issues in blended learning. There's a need for experimentation, research and theory to guide us. This is still a new area of development. It's very innovative and a lot of opportunities for innovative teaching here. Um, we need to look at the impact blended learning will have on the campus and the use of facilities. And in particular, your institution needs to have a plan for digital learning. Um, how is it going to look like post-COVID? So I suggest you, each institution probably needs an implementation task force, probably a, a, a small increase to instructional support staff, but more online resources for instructors so that they can find stuff when they need it. For instance, uh, University of British Columbia has some very good videos that instructors can access when they want to know how to make a good video, uh, just in time access to resources for instructors. I think we need more and better mandatory training for teaching in digital learning. And in, very importantly, we need to collect and track data. We need to know what kind of online and blended learning is going on in our institutions and how well that's working. As I said, this is still in a state of experimentation. And I think, it's, lastly, it's really important to communicate with government or funding agencies, students, parents and employers about the advantages of blended learning, uh, why you're going towards blended learning I think that blended learning reflects the way that people will work in future. It's the, developing the skills that students will need when they go into a, a work environment these days. And we need to have the right kind of teaching that supports uh, that kind of behavior. So what next? I think blended will be the new normal. We need to develop digital skills for a digital world. Uh, the, the uh, graphic at the top here is of a video games designer. Uh, I live in Vancouver. Uh, the entertainment industry has more revenues and more income than the whole of our mining, forestry and agricultural sectors put together. This is where the new work is going to be in the future. And we need to make sure we're developing people with the skills to work in there. I see some blended learning in every course. I see fully online for specific markets. Um, but most importantly, we need to get the right balance between in-person, campus-based, and online learning. And that means quality design and doing it right. So I wish you all good luck. This is uh, a tremendous challenge, but I think a very exciting one as well. So to wrap up, um, there are some general questions for discussion, but I hope you'll come up with your own. Uh, if you want to contact me, that's my contact address, and I have a website, and the whole YouTube channel uh, for other uh, uh, videos in this series.